insist that people, when they do movies, they talk about truth in Appalachia, and they show our people for what they are, upstanding, industrious people who have strong worth ethic, and certainly, by the count of churches in eastern Kentucky, fear God. Uh, we've had strong role models in the mountains. The people I grew up around were people that didn't complain, even if they didn't have a job. And you know how severe unemployment is in the mountains. They made it. And they learned to survive. We're survivors. The problem that I write about often, and I feel it's the root of all evils in Appalachia, and especially eastern Kentucky, is that we've been abused by the system because we've been ignored and overlooked. Apathy has set in because we finally become to feel that, that we have no way of curing the problems that affect us, when in fact we do. It's our government, and we need to gouge those people more and say, pay more attention to us, as the Appalachian Regional <coughs> Commission has, has done, because we have some catching up to do in the mountains. We supply the nation with a lot of coal, and they don't return the favor. Uh, I wrote 12 years ago, you may not have heard of me then, but you may have heard of what I said. I said we needed a new state called Eastern Kentucky. I said it in jest because I want the state to build us a road, and they did, but I still mean it. I think we'd be better off with a new state. Split about, just take our Eastern Kentucky coal counties and keep all of our money, and we could be the little Saudi Arabia of America. <laughs> and say, you want more coal? All right, then chip up some money and we'll talk to you about it. We could control our own destiny, but I'm not here to talk about uh, insurrection of the government or anything. I'm just here to talk about Appalachia, uh, and especially Lake Kentucky. Now, let me tell you about Lovely. It has 500 people. Um, I thought everybody would want to wear a t-shirt and a hat. You've seen these uh, Rooster Run hats, Judy? I thought a lovely Kentucky hat would be what everybody in Kentucky would want to wear. So I printed up a bunch of t-shirts and hats, and I don't even know where they are now. I haven't had even attempted to sell one in three years because they flopped. Um, so if you want, I, I was going to bring one, and I thought, no, that would be taking advantage of your talk today. But if you want a lovely Kentucky shirt or hat, I have some. I'm glad to give them away to you. They're at home somewhere. Um, and I have a second T-shirt that speaks to the, the business I'm in that I thought about bringing. I thought, no, that wouldn't apply. But I take it most places I'm asked to give talks, and it's usually about the newspaper business. And that's a black and white T-shirt I found in a shop. I said, applies to me. And it says, my lawyer can beat up your lawyer. <laughs> that applies to me because I've been sued, I think, uh, last week my lawyers were sued twice for representing me. <laughs> I was sued once for having been sued by a lawyer who I said sued me wrongly. <laughs> and that was lawsuit <clears throat> against me number uh, 12 or 13 in my 12 years as being a publisher in INS. Um, I have turned around and sued those people and gotten part of my money back because they sued me. So now they're suing me saying I picked on them. It's a never-ending battle, and, and one I don't take a bit of uh, pride in. But you got to fight when you're back into a corner, and we in the mountains uh, know a whole lot about that. I was born at Hatfield, Kentucky, in Pike County. So I knew something about people who spoke this. <clears throat> they look in the eye and tell you you misspelled their name. They do it every day to me. But yet they also call you, and they know a sense of right and wrong, and say the county judge is up here with a bulldozer grading off a house seat at my neighbor's house. And I've written all kinds of stories and taken pictures of that. But it stopped. That fellow is now a county judge in retirement with fox uh, dogs all around him. Uh, anyway, I just came to say that y'all to be proud of heritage and especially uh, don't ever let it go unsaid that people from out you are inferior in any shape, form, or fashion. It's not true. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to say to you uh, this morning on uh, my experiences in uh, doing genealogical research in Eastern Kentucky over a period of 35 years. 
Although I was born in Kentucky at Sherburn in Fleming County, I have been away uh, for a long time. And, uh, but I have still, I've maintained a good deal of acquaintance with Eastern Kentucky. And my earliest acquaintance with the people of Eastern Kentucky came primarily through my first two professions, a minister of the Christian Church and elementary school teacher. And if you don't think you get experience with the people, just try it. Uh, this took place in the 1950s and the 1960s. Then after I finished uh, my studies at Ohio State University, I took a position at Bill University in Montreal, where I have remained since. But in those 20 years, I have never broken my ties with my sense of place in Kentucky. And during those years, I have written uh, considerably for many journals, uh, because I would do research on the families of Eastern Kentucky. And for 16 years, I did write a genealogy column for the paper in Lewis County. So even though I'm a psychologist, I have still maintained a contact with uh, Eastern Kentucky people and genealogy. And I think that this has perhaps given me some particular insights into the nature of the people of this, re this region, because you cannot, one cannot experience various fields without perhaps having your perceptions uh, modified and cleared. And so a, a combination of religion, education, psychology, and history gives one a different means of uh, looking at situations and developing opinions. Sometimes it takes a distance, you know, to get perspective. And through the years, as I have returned to Kentucky, I have seen Kentucky change. I have, as I read the newspaper, I observe changes that cause me to wonder what is happening in Eastern Kentucky. And uh, some of the questions that I have come to ask, uh, uh, which breaks my original opinions of, of through my experiences of Eastern Kentucky, are the. Are Eastern Kentuckians really a, a homogeneous group of people, as some writers would suppose, or are they as diverse as any other selected sample of people? And are they to be praised for steadfastly clinging to certain identifi identifiable attitudes and ideas, or the, should they be alerted to the danger that certain attitudes hold for their destiny? And is there a mentality a general mentality in Eastern Kentucky, long ago developed, that acts counterproductively for Eastern Kentucky at the present. But I'm not here to philosophize, uh, but to tell you something about the genealogy, origin of these people of Eastern Kentucky, and what they were like. And uh, I'm not going to give you dry facts about who was the son of so-and-so and where he was born and how long he lived and where he's buried. I'm not going to deal in dry genealogical facts, but I want to give you some insight into the people, uh, the personality of these people that developed this rugged geographical entity. Contrary to what some people would have us to think, uh, our forebears in this area did leave many records behind and many traces of themselves. There are more records on Eastern Kentucky people available than most people would believe. Uh, considering the harshness, uh, the ruggedness of the terrain and the difficulty that these people had uh, for access to courthouses and to government resources, I find it amazing that Eastern Kentucky has preserved such a vast amount of old court records, old census records, tax records, pension applications, and all those things. But of all these records, the one record that has given me the most insight into the nature of these people is the old civil lawsuit, because it is there that the real person came out as he testified in court and as he fought with his lawyers for what he saw as his integrity and his rights. And so it is the old civil lawsuits. It's in those lawsuits that most people never, ever have any access to that one finds the, the uh, traces of the basic nature of these people, the accounts of their quarrels, their, their daily activities, 
uh, that into their depositions and into their uh, bills of complaints. Uh, there are peculiar concepts of insult and injury, and their touchiness over boundary lines of their land, or what they felt was their land, and their readiness uh, to defend their honor and their impatience to let the law take its course. So of all the court records, in my opinion, the old civil lawsuits are the most valued court records existing in terms of providing an insight into what these people were really like in the day-to-day -day life, the day-to-day -day life of the inhabitants of this region. It is through these suits and these old lawsuits, and incidentally, I abstracted every case between 1807 and 1855 with the county of Lewis, and I've abstracted uh, numerous court cases all throughout eastern Kentucky. It is through these suits, lawsuits, that I have developed a broad repertoire of facts on the customs and the attitudes and the language and the concepts of these people. Now, some of the ideas I would like to project to you, some of them you may very severely disagree with me, but uh, I'm a Kentuckian, you're a Kentuckian, we perhaps can, can disagree without resorting to mayhem. So, uh, what I uh, see in the early lawsuits is this, is that the old land grants and the patents and their ambiguity set the stage for a litigious and land-conscious people. I had to go into one of my confers. I was looking through the Oxford Dictionary. I said, Frank, I really have not been able to find litigious in the dictionary, but I'm sure it exists. I mean, it must have does exist, I'm sure. Uh, so I point out that I felt the contentious uh, behavior uh, over land came about in a natural way. One cannot examine the old lawsuits without seeing that the Eastern Kentuckians in a sense, love to go to law. Uh, there may be a, and there may be a good reason for this, because they had a great deal of practice at it in the earliest days of the Commonwealth. The early land speculators, uh, the developers and the independent settlers, often found that their early land claims overlapped on that of someone else, or that another person had a prior claim to the land. And even though they had gone through the legal motions that were required, that of marking the trees and building a cabin and planting a few rows of corn, the uh, procedures for registration at the Virginia Land Office were not exactly perfect. And this gave rise to ambiguities and conflict. So that years on the road, people found, I'm living on land, that really belongs to someone else. Poor Simon Kenton was forever being dragged into a courthouse somewhere throughout Kentucky to give a deposition to establish the name of some stream and who he had seen there, because people would say, well, when I was there, it was called this name, and somebody else said, no, it was called this name. And incidentally, one of the most interesting discoveries I ever had was with regards to Fox Creek in Fleming County. I always thought, well, it's just named for the animal fox. But in one of Simon Kenton's depositions, he says, no, I was out on that creek uh, surveying with uh, Arthur Fox. He fell into the creek and got himself all wet, and we said, well, let's just call it Fox Creek. So the actual name for Fox Creek, uh, which is not far from here, is really Fox Creek. Now, the persons with these huge land grants, which they thought were clear and legal, would sell these tracts to groups of individuals, and then some years down the road, they would find that someone else would present a prior claim or a conflicting claim to the land. Then this poor settler was found himself caught in the midst of a legal battle between two persons who claimed the original title, title to the land. So some of our less patient ancestors said, well, just let them have it out. We're pulling up stakes, calling it quits, 
Next, we're going to Missouri or Illinois or Indiana or someplace else where our land claims will be clear. But others, the tough ones perhaps, stayed on to fight the land claims. So there's only one that clear into the 1850s you will find in the deeds of the courthouses of Eastern Kentucky and most of Kentucky clauses defending individuals against the dubious claims of a third party. For example, along the Ohio River, the Blaine family received a grant from King George III. Well, after the Revolutionary War, that didn't count anymore and the land was then granted to a Wilson family. But for perhaps 30-some years, these two groups of people were in litigation over who rightfully owned the land or who could claim the land. Another example of these conflicting land claims that was forever bringing people into the courthouse was the city of Vanceburg. It was laid out on a tract of land which was uh, purchased from Alexander T. Marshall who he thought had a clear title, a grant to this land. And people bought the town lots. They began to build houses on these lots. And then it was found Alexander Marshall didn't have any, any clear title. The Virginia Land Office had no record of his grant or his patent. So it was clear into the 1830s that people were trying to ban their claims to the land in this town. And it, took, it ha was very difficult for a town to progress under such circumstances because who would risk building a very expensive building on land that you were not sure belonged to you? So it's my intention, uh, if we're, uh, since we're uh, speaking on Appalachia, a sense of place, uh, it's my contention that this myth of the registration of lands at the Virginia Land Office and other places and the lack of clarity of surveyor lines and multiple names for streams set the stage for people to be ready to fight for their land. And no doubt, many greatly embraced the clarity of the township divisions of the northern states, and they just moved for further north and west to get away from it. In some measure, uh, I cannot help but feel that this early conflict then uh, over land claims help set and maintain a very defensive attitude toward one's land, a sense of place. And the idea was, this is my land, I have worked for it, and it's unreasonable that someone is now trying to take it away from me. Another uh, idea which has come through to me from the old lawsuit is uh, the idea of the intent uh, and the fierce defense of the right of the individual among the Appalachian person, or particularly, in my experience, the Eastern Kentucky person. There's little doubt about the early East Kentuckian being a very individualist person. The defense of simple values uh, at an individual level, in my estimation, took precedence over social norms, uh, the greater social uh, good and the laws and statutes of commonwealth if they moved too slowly. So the early settler then became uh, quick to, de to defend his individual rights or what he perceived to be his individual rights and was not re averse to resorting to mayhem should he be thwart thwarted in his efforts exercise his individual rights. I'd like to give some anecdotal material because I don't want to go on with attitudes and ideas, but from some of the old lawsuits, I, I picked up some very interesting examples of people really uh, defending their individual rights. Uh, in one case, I recall a man was uh, setting out some locust trees on a fence line that was disputed, and his neighbor kept saying to him, the line is not clear. Stop setting trees on the line. But Mr. Snyder persisted in setting trees on the line. So Mr. Carr simply went over and hit him over the head with a shovel. So, <laughs> or take the example of the tavern guest who 
stabbed because he several times asked another guest to see the new dirt that he had bought. And the other guest said, well, here, you can see it very well. And he stabbed him in the chest. So uh, here was a, a case of don't violate my privacy. Or one that happened in Bath County, which I have always laughed about, is the man whose dog bit another man's hog. And the man who in turn up the dog. And then that man shot his hog, and when both the animals killed, they turned on one another. So these are the kinds of, of approaches to settling personal disputes that one sees. Or, last of all, that the woman uh, of questionable virtue, or as some people call a soiled dove, whose house was burned down in her absence because she refused to move and being requested to do so by her neighbors. So there are many examples throughout court cases, and I'm sure it's a place in other parts of the country, but it seems that there was that quickness to say, if I can't do, uh, get my individual rights uh, satisfied through uh, a quick uh, discussion of it, I can't really wait for law to take its uh, course. It's been noticeable to me especially your lawsuits, the individual rights and liberties were not kept in perspective with the greater social welfare of the community. I work with a considerable number of retired individuals in Montreal. Many of these people are of European extraction. They have uh, gone through terrible wars. They have gone through persecutions, holocausts. Uh, all kinds of financial reversals and moving to a new land and, and learning a new language. And these people become very aggressive and very assertive. And when I pass out papers in the classroom, they're almost up in arms if they don't receive them immediately because they have learned if I'm going to get what I want, I have to be very aggressive and very assertive. And sometimes I have to remind them, look, it may have taken a great deal of assertiveness a great deal of aggressiveness to get ahead in life. But maybe that is not inappropriate for you now. Maybe that is an outmoded approach to getting what you want. So I think we might look in Eastern Kentucky at ourselves, although some traits that are, were exhibited among the early settlers in order to survive, there may have been needed traits. And they may have been admirable qualities in the lives and times then. And it may have maintained their stalwart dignity to remain independent. But it can work in a negative direction at the present time and can become counterproductive. Last summer, while I was staying at my home here in Kentucky, I was, I was really quite amazed at an article that I read in a Central Kentucky newspaper in which someone had written very eloquently, who are those bluegrass people to tell us that we can't throw trash in the stream? We, how, who are they to tell us how to live? We, this is our land and our streams and our forests, and who are they to tell us what to do with it? Now, I understand that there are uh, more complications and more um, complexities than just uh, stand out on the surface. But I, if I think there has to be, for people to go, a movement away from traits and values and attitudes that lose their appropriateness and, and lose their usefulness and do not work counterproductively, uh, or that do work counterproductively, rather. A third point that uh, has been interesting to me is the heterogeneity of origin of many of the people of Eastern Kentucky. Not long ago, I was reading Gunther Grass's book, Headbirth, or The Demons Are Dying. And in this book, he speculates, wonder what the world would be like if there were the opposite number of Germans and Chinese in the world. For example, if there were one billion Germans and as many Chinese as there are Germans. 
and he speculates what the world would be like. I remember speaking to one of my colleagues who is of German birth, and I said, Christopher, what do you think the world would be like if there were as many Germans as there are Chinese? She said, well, the world would be very organized, but it would be so organized that we would forget what we are going to do. So <laughs> I often wondered, in this makeup of Eastern Kentucky, what would Eastern Kentucky have been like if it had been settled by, uh, purely by Germans? What would it have been like if it had been settled by Swiss? Harry Caudle speculates in his writings what it may have been like. The hills may have been terraced and vineyards going. Uh, what would it have been like if it had been settled by Frenchmen? I suspect it would be considerably different. That there would have been a different approach, a different mentality, perhaps. But nevertheless, the people of Eastern Kentucky have generally been pictured as having had their origins almost entirely in England and Scotland, and a few a sprinkling from Ireland, very few Irish Catholics, however. But I have found a remarkable diversity of names in Eastern Kentucky records that include German, French, Dutch, and Welsh. For example, the family Oakshire in Eastern Kentucky, a French Huguenot family. Uh, many uh, families that people are totally aware of because of their anglicized spelling were originally French or of German origin. It would also appear that even though there were many settlers whose roots truly do go back to the indentured servants who were sent out from England, there were many, many others who were not the descendants of indentured servants and came by other means and for different reasons to Eastern Kentucky. But in all of this, there was more likely to be, however, an individualistic approach to settlement in Eastern Kentucky, more so than in the other parts of the state. And here's the reason I think so. Primarily, I think this is true because there were fewer established churches in Eastern Kentucky, such as Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopal, Catholic. These structured, established churches encouraged people to settle in groups or in entities. There was throughout, you see, Central Kentucky, numerous settlements, for example, that led by Father David Rice and the Baptist minister, Lewis Craig, who invented bourbon for us, I think, and others. Uh, these, these religious groups would move as an entity into central Kentucky, and there uh, the eastern Kentucky, uh, rather the central Kentucky settler, moved perhaps in a community already established. My mother's family came from around Rockville, Maryland, with a whole group of people uh, landed people and settled in Bourbon County. So they didn't start from uh, number one in their development. They already had a community when they got there. But the Eastern Kentucky settler was more likely an individualist, and if he was a member of a religious group, it was a less structured and less formal one. And that's one of the reasons that in genealogical research we we have very little reliance on church records for any genealogical material. So it seems to me that this may have contributed somewhat again to this rugged uh, individualist mentality, a feeling of lacking an advocate in times of trouble, a lack of groupness or one's place in the social context or one's part of a social community. In some respects, a certain fatalism could set in when one feels all alone. I am on my own, and I must accept what comes, and any resistance must be through my own individual resistance or strength. Because within organized religious society, the priest, the rabbi, or the educated Protestant member often serves as a model, an encourager, an advocate, and so forth. But the Eastern Kentucky person 
settling in a remote, rugged region, perhaps often could not even have a formal funeral for a deceased person until the visiting minister passed through the community. So I think that contributes to an individualism there. The old lawsuits reflect some of the pathos and the fatalism of these people in their remoteness and their feelings uh, of, of uh, I am on my own and I must settle my own accounts because I have no one else to settle these for me. In the case of a young man named Manny Toll, Emmanuel Toll, one day he and a fellow were at a spring having a cool drink of water after working in the field and for some reason they got into an altercation and Manny stabbed his friend. And his friend, of course, did not die immediately, but peritonitis uh, set in. And for two or three days, he lingered. And the court records, the depositions, and the testimony of the people around give a by day account of how this man calls his, his antagonist in and forgives him and tells him, I bear no grudge against you, and the, uh, the whole family uh, agrees it, is, it was not altogether your fault. A sort of a sense of fatalism, and this is something we have to settle on our own. Or the, the fight uh, in the churchyard between the two factions of a church, which resulted in the indictment of the preacher and several church members for fighting with one another. Uh, it's something that we would find quite difficult to accept in these days, but an attitude of we're on our own, there's no bishop to come in here and settle it for us. We uh, will have to settle this on our own. Or, for example, the, uh, the young man who was giving a political speech at a schoolhouse and is taunted by uh, one of his friends throwing rocks at the schoolhouse the whole time he was giving his speech. And he just left his podium and went out and stabbed his antagonist. So, uh, and he died, <laughs> incidentally. And the pathetic description that we find uh, almost a, an acceptance of this is something I have no power to do anything about. I'm really on my own. One very admirable Revolutionary War veteran describes in his application for a pension that coming down from White uh, Cross Plains, New York, I believe it is, he just had enough money to pay his passage a certain distance, and he was taken off the boat because he didn't have enough money to get to Limestone or Maysville, and he was just set off on the riverbank with what few worldly goods he had. But Thomas Marshall of Washington, Kentucky, came by and saw his destitute circumstances and gave him a piece of land back in the hills, to, I think it's on the border of Rowan County now, uh, for him to live in. So in these lawsuits, you, don't, you get a different perspective on the lives of these people than if you were to just read deeds and wills and marriage records and so forth. You see the real nitty-gritty of life circumstances and how people dealt with these circumstances. There's also a great deal of humor in them, a, an archaic language, uh, and uh, certain uh, expressions that are preserved there. Uh, we have been told many times that in Eastern Kentucky there is a, a considerable remnant of Elizabethan English. I'm often caught speaking certain statements uh, at McGill. Uh, my colleagues from England or Scotland will suddenly look up and say, I haven't heard that expression since I was a child back in Scotland uh, or in England. Uh, so I think there, were, there is a, a preservation of language among Eastern Kentuckians that goes back a long ways. And in the old records, the old lawsuits, there is a preservation of this archaic language. In these days, however, one does not tend to think of a court trial as having any humor. If there's anything we don't want to get involved in these days, it's a lawsuit. But in those days, for the old settlers, and especially their lawyers, 
It was an opportunity to be on center stage and to be somebody. It was an opportunity to really put on an act. The lawyers, no doubt, found their clients funny and eccentric, and they were not above adding a little bit to it to, to just make it even a greater attraction. And they were, because they were very adept at enhancing uh, their business by making court cases very exciting and entertaining. You cannot read these cases without seeing that the attorneys were very interested in putting on a show for the people as well. And how else can one for account, uh, how else can one account the fact that a lawyer wrote a dramatic counter charge, which he spoke in court, when one man claimed that his neighbor's stallion had killed his mare in the breeding process. Now, uh, this man was a literary genius. I would have read it, but in mixed company, I don't think it would be in good taste. But the prose, the innuendos, the double entendre are unbelievable. That a man could write such a piece of literature about a stallion damaging a mare to the point of death. That, so I'd say we're not above uh, injecting some humor into the courtroom to make it even more desirable to go to court. And then another case of an old Indian fighter and Revolutionary War soldier who was summoned to court to testify in a court case. But prior to his going in to testify in the case, some of his friends get him so drunk he can't stand up when he gets on the witness stand. So the judge promptly arrests him for contempt of court. Of course, being a humorous situation, finding this very uh, revered man get it being so drunk he can talk in the witness stand. And blackmailing was easily in incited as well. I recall one case which starts out as a very minor case and ends in a very serious one when a very prominent family lays charges against a young woman or young lady for a minor theft. And she manages somehow to weave into her testimony that the man who was accusing her had to leave Culpeper County, Virginia because he was accused of arson. <laughs> so she was not averse to blackmailing him in the courthouse. And that is, it is uh, absolutely creative how the linkage of dates and places could be done by citing particular instances. I remember one man who says, I remember the date that it happened very well because it was only that evening, I know that it was this date, because it was that evening that my son was delivered by my wife onto my knees in the biblical way of birth. And the colorful language was rampant in the divorce cases because at that time one could not get a divorce without proof of adultery. Otherwise you have to go through some very uh, ticklish legal maneuvers to get a divorce in those days. days. The vivid imagination <laughs> and the, the accusations, of course, had to be tempered with allegorical language. And every figure of speech from a simile to an apostrophe was used in, used in the courtroom to, uh, to be able to very discreetly describe what had taken place without being vulgar. One of the most memorable statements I think I ever read in a court case in terms of colorful language and in figures of speech was the case of a woman who was accused of poisoning her son-in-law with arsenic by gradually putting arsenic into his food. The witness based her information on the fact that the young man regurgitated in front of her and she said it was the color of green apples cooked in an iron pot. Well, she said she, thus she knew she, he had been poisoned when she saw that, had been poisoned with arsenic. Now, I asked a very old lady once, how, what does this mean? And she very delicately described the fact that when green apples are cooked in an iron pot, they turn a certain color. But I thought 
this turn of a figure of speech, this analogy, uh, or whatever one would call it, uh, these things are rampant uh, throughout the old court cases because the uh, old settler perhaps did not have at his or her command the words to put it into abstract language. So what is the next best thing to do? Make an analogy or, or draw uh, some type of a, a, a figure of speech to describe it. A prominent man at Vansburg once stated in a case involving a runaway slave that the only way a person along the Ohio River could sleep, uh, keep a slave in the 1850s was to keep him in his pocket. A very uh, unusual statements like that. And incidentally, uh, in the law cases of Eastern Kentucky, I have written uh, several papers on this. The cases involving mistreatment of the black person and slave at that time was very remarkable. Uh, uh, one of the most outstanding cases I came upon was uh, a case of a black man who certainly exercised his intelligence to the hilt. He belonged to a woman at Carlisle, Kentucky. It sounds almost uh, unbelievable we can say a person belonged to somebody. Uh, he belonged to a woman at Carlisle, Kentucky, and she had hired him out for work at a county along the Ohio River. And in those days, a black person could not get on a steamboat and go up the river or down the river without uh, someone accompanying this person to make sure he did not get away. Somehow or another, this man got on the steamboat Bostona. He went up the river as far as Portsmouth. He got off the boat. He was never seen again because he was on free territory. And so the judge, of course, uh, uh, the, the woman sued the, the steamboat company, and she won, and they had to repay her. And I remember the judge said, and, sh and the uh, Bostona Steamboat Company shall pay her the full value of this person and his services, and if they do not possess the money, they shall sell the steamboat itself and pay her. <laughs> so uh, it is remarkable what one finds on the behavior of these people and how times have changed. One further example, and then I shall try to start bringing this to a close. I don't want to overwhelm you with, with these unusual anecdotes, which some of you may be saying, I don't know if those are really true or he's making them up, but believe me, I'm not making them up. One attorney, uh, for lack of a better means of vindictiveness, acted as an attorney for his sister in her divorce case. Now, that's a bad combination to start out with. The attorney brother-in-law had such a dislike for his sister's husband that at the close of the case, he wrote a lengthy case summary describing debauchery of his brother-in-law in the most eloquent language that one could ever imagine. And he concluded it by saying, remember his vindictiveness, he concluded it by saying that he was purposely writing it to leave behind in the county ar archives a record for posterity so that they might know what a detestable man his sister's husband was. <laughs> so uh, you can see the types of things that they resorted to. But the attorney shortly asked moved to Missouri, and the formerly divorced man and his w uh, wife lie side by side today, and ironically, just in front of the grave of the mother-in-law, who also shared in the verbal outrage against her son-in-law. I've never understood that, how they could hate one another so much, but yet be buried side by side. Well, I should bring these things to a close, I think, if I have not amply uh, illustrated or given examples for you of the, the interesting um, literary nature of the old lawsuit. There's no use for me to go on. But in this sense of community and this sense of place that we're talking about, it calls to mind to me a quote from the late philosopher and 
a religious historian, Yesia Eliade, who died in Chicago last April. One of his famous quotes is, that every man thinks of his community as the center of the world. And it is true. We, we can live in a place so long that we begin to think that it is the center of the world. We get such a sense of place that we lose our perspective of the world beyond us. I remember when I uh, decided to move to Montreal, a man said to me, it's too far away to amount to anything. <laughs> so we can lose our perspective on, on things. But I can see through my 30-some years of research in genealogy, and incidentally, I, I'm not so terribly old, it's just that I started so young. It, it, in these years of research uh, throughout Eastern Kentucky, uh, I have had thousands of letters from every state in the Union while writing my, my genealogy column and corresponding with people that show that there were thousands of people who left this region. They just could not deal with the region. They could not deal with the times uh, that were going on. And so for many people, Kentucky became a temporary residence but it seemed to have a lasting impact and had developed in them a sense of my having belonged at one time in that area. And it's amazing. Throughout the nation west of here, and now through high levels of uh, mobility throughout the nation and foreign countries, Descendants of Eastern Kentuckians are spread throughout the nation and the world, so to speak. When I first started out in genealogy in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, there was very little interest in the genealogy of Eastern Kentucky. It was as though, well, there are no records. These people don't know anything about their background. There was more of an emphasis on let's Let's uh, preserve the records of the bluegrass. Let, let's look at those records, because there really isn't anything on eastern Kentucky. So there was, there was little genealogical research in eastern Kentucky. But over the years, because we have come to realize that there is a great amount of material on the people of eastern Kentucky, there has been uh, a, a really an explosion on the scene of interest in the families, uh, the history uh, of, of this region of the state. In the last uh, 20 years, there's been a great deal of activity in trying to bring together, uh, through the Eastern Kentucky Genealogical Society, the records of Eastern Kentucky and Southwest Virginia and West Virginia. Uh, one of my uh, best friends, Ms. M. Jackson of Ashland, Kentucky, has played an unbelievable role in, uh, in gathering together a vast amount of material uh, with on, her, uh, on the families of East Kentucky. And she and I together published several years ago a, a book on Eastern Kentucky families. And uh, the little genealogical publication, The Tree Shaker, and over in Lewis County, where my residence is, the Shaken and Diggin' magazine. All of these are uh, what one would call cottage industry types of publications. It does show that there has been uh, a remarkable pride developed in Eastern Kentucky, for which I'm very happy. In my genealogical research, I have never been interested in pursuing blue bloods and royal lineage and so forth. I've always been interested in these plain, ordinary, common people and what their day-to-day -day lives were like. And I suppose that's why I found the old civil lawsuits to be absolutely a treasure house of information, and they certainly should be preserved, because it is in them you get more than the dry dates of birth and death and marriage and land <coughs> transactions and so forth. You see uh, their attitudes and their, their feelings. 
and the colorful uh, stories of the lawsuits turn statistics into living people. And that is what I am more interested in, uh, being a, a psychologist. Naturally, I think I would, should be interested in people or else I should get out of the profession. Uh, but the kind interest in the nature of people and their personality and their behavior has caused uh, me to be very uh, perceptive of the language uh, that describes the behavior of these people. I appreciate your attention and uh, your, maybe your interest in this topic. Uh, it is an area that I have found has been very enriching uh, to my life. Uh, it is a side of my uh, work that I rarely ever mention to my colleagues in Montreal because I sometimes think they wouldn't understand why is this person here tracing ancestors of people in eastern Kentucky all the time. Uh, but it, I think you can see the connection that, there, uh, that exists here. And I hope someday when I am able to, to walk out of my office and leave every psychology book on the shelf and say, here, come and take them, and I can come back uh, to this state or some nearby state and just delve into my filing cabinets of uh, material on Eastern Kentucky families and come up with something that will be of benefit to you and your children and grandchildren and so on down the line. I thank you for your attention. Getting pretty near class time, some of you guys. But if uh, anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. To the body of my paper, I would to uh, say something which might uh, slightly broaden the significance of my paper uh, for some of you who may be students in American literature. Uh, Senator, who will be the main subject of my paper, was the grandfather of, of Peter Taylor. Uh, some of you may know his work. Uh, this last year, Peter Taylor won the uh, Ritz-Hemingway Award for his novel summons to Memphis, and then following that won the uh, Pulitzer Prize. Uh, my bringing that out is to, is to add significance. I'm extremely uh, uh, proud of, of Peter Taylor, as I am uh, proud of certain aspects of, 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 of Senator Taylor's career here. But I bring it out uh, simply to add significance. Um, as Glenn mentioned, I have done a series of articles uh, dealing with Senator uh, Taylor. I have tried always in the past to um, maintain as much as possible a kind of neutrality and therefore to take a stance in which I would not have to be in a position of promoting uh, his importance in some way or the other. I intended to do the same thing when I submitted my proposal for the paper on this program. I then wrote the paper after. Uh, after reading the paper, I noticed that it does sound more emotional uh, than I intended it to be. I hope there's a deeper significance in it than that, but uh, I, I, I wish you to be aware of my intentions, uh, perhaps rather than uh, of my final product. In June 1906, Robert L. Taylor, a former governor and my great uncle, was at the top of his powers. Almost certainly, he was the best known politician from the Southern Appalachian region. According to one Appalachian political opponent, he had not been much of a governor, but he was the best public entertainer in the South. His comic lecturing was so lucrative, it permitted him to finance his own regional magazine, which published his columns regularly between 1905 and 1908. Finally, he had just won the Tennessee Democratic primary, which made inevitable his election to the United States Senate the following year. Taylor's mind was not devoid of ideas, although he sometimes seemed intent on conveying the opposite impression. He championed industrializing or New South ideas. Back in the 19th century, to the extent that Taylor belonged to any wing of the Tennessee Democratic Party, he belonged to the New South or the industrialist wing. Accepting the New South doctrine meant that he was more inclined to employ the rhetoric of industrialism and advocate industrializing policies than the politicians of the dominant Bourbon faction. The Bourbons were more agrarian and more numerous, and Taylor was unique among Tennessee politicians in alienating the Bourbons and still being able to win the governorship three times. Not everyone today is enamored of the New South creed, and therefore may well conclude that Taylor's influence, to the extent that he had any, was bad. 
but I'm trying to explain what happened and why, and not what should have happened. In this paper, I will try to demonstrate how, by 1906, Taylor had evolved a potentially important new New South argument, a new justification, technical education, which was another way of arguing for industrializing the South. The South, of course, included central Appalachia, and Taylor's idea may have been southern Appalachia's contribution to the New South ideology. Most of all, I will try to show how his personal needs, which include an obsessive sense of place, shaped this new idea. Taylor grew up in a political family. He was born July the 31st, 1850, in Carter County, Upper East Tennessee, the third son of Nathaniel Green Taylor and Emma Haynes Taylor. His birthplace was called Happy Valley, in which always had true meaning for him. Nathaniel was a Whig politician, but Emma's brother, Landon Carl Haynes, was a Democrat. The Haynes family lived near the Taylors. Other commentators, including Bob Taylor himself, have noted that Haynes became Bob Taylor's hero and model. Elsewhere, I've tried to explain this transaction and some of its consequences. Much of this paper will be a continuation of that process. In fact, so much of this paper will be devoted to describing the role that Haynes played in making Taylor the politician of place that you may conclude it should be titled Politicians of Place, Sisters Haynes and Taylor. In July 1850, Haynes had just finished a term as Speaker of the Tennessee House of Representatives. During the previous February, he had delivered one of his few surviving addresses. It was his farewell address to the Tennessee House, and he had incorporated into it references to the welfare institutions his chamber of the legislature had agreed to support. In the two passages that I'm going to quote, please note for future reference the family and home metaphors. It is as if um, I'm sorry, also, please note how Haynes goes out of his way for, to reach for them. It is as if he were obsessed with family and home. The deaf whose ears have never polluted with the voice of harmony, the blind who have never seen a mother's face, nor a star in the heavens, and the insane whose reason has dropped from its place by falling star, these all have been provided for. You have taken these children of misfortune with the fitness of a mother, you have drawn them to the bosom of the public charities and made them to feel that they have a home and an abiding place in their native state. In closing, Haynes lamented the separation of colleagues the adjournment of the legislature would mean and added, but I feel that the pain of separation is to a great extent modified by the pleasing reflection that we are soon to return to the sweet circles of home, where wife and children have their empire, where the fires domestic bliss burn on the altar of wedded love, where those reside who fall, whose office it is to wipe away the tears of sorrow and smooth the brow of care and bring back to the hearts the sunshine of the spirit and point with the hand of hope toward a brighter future. You note that strong feminist argument uh, which he's making there. There is one other pertinent address which Haynes delivered <coughs> during this period. It is available only through the memory of a member of its audience. Haynes was invited to address a railroad meeting at Ebbington in southwest Virginia. An admirer reports that Haynes described the natural beauty of, of his native East Tennessee with golden speech and told of the inexhaustible wealth hid in the forests and mines and the result of its development through the agency of the railroad so accurately that his speech has proved to be prophecy. The point is not that Haynes failed to see the threat of the machine in the garden. It is that he wanted full-scale and drill exploitation. It is true that he was espousing the Appalachian Tennessee party line, but not every Democrat did. State Representative Haynes had part of the same constituency that United States Representative Andrew Johnson had. Like Haynes, Johnson was a Democrat, but, but Johnson opposed railroads, which he believed would create unconstitutional monopolies, would impoverish tavern keepers and wagoners, and defile the landscape. In 1851, about the same time as the railroad speech, Haynes attempted to seize Johnson's congressional seat. He lost and retired from politics until 1859 when, with Johnson in the Senate, Haynes won the Democratic congressional nomination. He lost the general election, but during the campaign he said that if secession came, Tennessee should back the South because it would be a traitorous son who would stab the mother who bore him. The next year, Haynes was elector on the Breckinridge presidential ticket. Of this experience, the biographer of his public career has written, before serving as a Breckinridge elector for the state at large, Haynes' reputation as an eloquent orator and convincing debater was limited to East Tennessee. This canvas made it possible for him to extend his reputation over the entire state. 
The next year, as Middle and West Tennessee were deciding to secede, Haynes too, his decision was not foregone. He had a genuine choice. Fellow East Tennessee Democrat Andrew Johnson did not go with the secessionists. In the short run, Haynes' decision paid off. He was elected to the Confederate Senate. But the family was divided. Haynes' brother-in-law, Nathaniel, supported the Union cause and in 1865 was elected first congressional district representative, a, posi a position he had held for a term during the 1850s. After that, he became Andrew Johnson's Commissioner of Indian Affairs before retiring from politics in 1869. In Senate, however, he apparently evolved into a Republican. After the war, Haynes, allegedly through the intercession of his sister Emma, was pardoned for his Civil War activities by President Johnson, but forced out of Unionist East Tennessee. During his West Tennessee exile, he utter uttered a sometimes quoted lament, one that contained more flowers than the mountains he pined for. According to the family mythology, the lament was delivered in Jackson, Tennessee, in reaction to a remark by General Nathan Bedford Forrest, who, while teasing Haynes, had called East Tennessee godforsaken. Some of the more exquisite lines of Haynes' reply were as follows. I was born in East Tennessee on the banks of the Watauga, which in the Indian vernacular means a full river, and beautiful river it is. I have stood upon its banks in my childhood and looked upon its, gla its, its glassy waters, and there beheld a heaven above, and then looked up and beheld, <coughs> I'm sorry, and there be uh, looked up, uh, down upon its glassy waters, and there beheld a heaven below, and then looked up and beheld a heaven above, reflecting two vast mirrors, each in the other, its moons, its planets, and trembling stars. Haynes went on caressingly in this fashion until he wound down, testifying that he had seen Morn get up from her saffron bed and come forth like a queen robed in her garments of light and stand tiptoe on the misty mountains, and black night flew away from her glorious face to his bedchamber at the pole, and she lighted the green veil and beautiful river where I was born and played in childhood with a smile of sunshine. O oh, beautiful land of the mountains with thy sun painted cliffs, how can I ever forget thee? He couldn't, and neither could his nephew Bob. Bob Taylor and his brother Alf, in the meanwhile, were developing political allegiances. Alf, who was two years older than Bob, believed that he was accepting the political principles of his father and became a Republican. Bob, accepting those of his uncle Landon, became a Democrat. Bob spent a sickly youth. He became his mother's favorite, perhaps for that reason. Favorite children often find it hard to leave home, and intellectually, Bob never did. I think being his mother's favorite principally explains his lifelong obsession with home and family. However, the loss of home, the expulsion from the garden experienced by his uncle, who was also his hero and model, could have been the principal cause of Bob's strong sense of place. Certainly it confirmed it, and thereby may have turned a sense into an obsession. Bob displayed an early gift for performing. He played the fiddle, but mostly he told jokes and funny stories and found that he had a talent for ingratiating, <coughs> for conveying an ingratiating public image. These talents were transferable to politics. In 1878, he won the first district congressional seat, skillfully packaging himself as the mountain boy. In 1884, he served as elector on the Cleveland Hendricks ticket, spreading his reputation across the state as Haynes had done back in 1860. In 1886, he won the Tennessee governorship by defeating his brother Alf. But after that, things did not go smoothly. His dispensing of patronage made enemies, but most of all, following the model of his uncle Landon, he lined up with the New South Wing Party and antagonized the Bourbons royally. In 1888, they fought his renomination through 39 ballots before giving up. Taylor served another term, but left his office in January 1891, buffeted and bruised. Later, he stated that he left office sick. Almost certainly, he left the governorship resolved never to seek executive or maybe political office again. <coughs> in October, he began his lecturing career. Bob's lectures do not read well, as his jokes do not, uh, do not either. But on his tongue, they were effective, and they permitted him to express his ideas and conflicts better than his political speeches do. Three pertinent themes emerged from his early 90, 1890s lectures. The first can be titled, Flat in Your Own Firmament, a phrase he used later, characteristic of Taylor's long public argument with himself against going back into politics and seeking the Senate seat his uncle, in a manner of speaking, had held. Second, introduced the theme of home, which he'd find both as family and as <coughs> his Appalachian childhood resident. And finally, he introduced the theme of paradise loss, which was often tied to the loss of home and childhood. Taylor titled his first lecture, The Fiddle in the Bow, and cast it in the form of a dream. 
Truly, childhood is the nearest approach in this world to the paradise of long ago, he wrote profoundly. He later fantasized about a return to Happy Valley. The house where I was born was silent and deserted as I peered through the dusty window pane and looked upon the desolate hearthstone that once glowed with the light of love and happiness. I thought my mother came back across the flood of vanished years and sang, <coughs> and, and, and sang there again the sweet old songs she used to sing in the happy long ago, but it was all a dream. Bob later drafted a second lecture titled Dixie, which he delivered jointly with his brother Alf's Yankee Doodle. He called Dixie the second paradise, demonstrating that he made no distinction between the South and the Appalachian South. Then he proclaimed the standard New South doctrine on sectionalism and race when he said that he believed not in sectional lines, but in sectional patriotism, which loves home better than any other spot on earth. And <clears throat> here, is the, uh, here is only one race problem, which is engaging our thought and energy, and that is a race between Yankee Doodle and Dixie for industrial supremacy. Apparently, his lecture was very successful, bringing him plenty of appointments and paying him well. His manager later said that if Bob Taylor had invested his proceeds widely, he could have had been a millionaire who, according to John Jacob Astor, could live almost as well as a rich man. But in 1896, the Democrats were in trouble. Vote-getting was Bob Taylor's specific political gift, and he was approached about running. At the time, he was on his Yankee Doodle and Dixie tour, but he agreed to come home and run what historian Robert H. White has called the happy home ticket. His opening address contained the following statement. When I am on the platform, I act the fool at a dollar apiece for these town folks. But when I am on the huttings preaching the gospel of democracy to the people, salvation is free. If I had the power, I would convert every mosquito into a butterfly and every Republican into a Democrat. I would give to, I, I would give to every man between the two oceans a happy home and hand in every happy home a fiddle and a bow. <clears throat> he won a close race. Once again, he found himself middle in the governorship and became sick. By late May 1897, he was telling a Knoxville Journal reporter that he was considering resigning his office. And in October, he told an audience at Knoxville St Street Fair and Trade Carnival, I have three times won the highest honor in the gift of the people of my native state, and there is only one retreat where I have ever found rest from the flattery of hollow hearts, rest from the ingratitude of politics. That retreat is my humble home, where the bees gather honey from the poplar blossoms, where the voices of happiness echo in the sweet solitudes, and where brawling books, leaping from lofty heights, break into pearls and silvery foam and ripple on the rivers in eternal melody. You should not be surprised if you find that this lyricism echoes familiarly. It is a very slight version on the theme sounded at least a quarter of a century earlier by Bob's uncle Landon Carter Haynes. The speech Bob delivered the following month, November 1897, invoked the light motif even more clearly. He specifically uh, <coughs> addressed the former Tennesseans who had migrated to Texas. My wandering friends from Tennessee, when I go back to the land of your nativity and view the Blue Mountains in the springtime and the summer, by the way, before I get, uh, get into this flower garden, uh, I uh, might say to you that, that he, he is speaking as governor of Tennessee, but er everything he describes here is of Appalachian Tennessee, of his childhood home, showing again this, 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 this obsession. And in his farewell address of January 1899, he turned to his old theme of home as a refuge from ingratitude. I'm about to shuffle off this mortal coil of pikes and fly away to the haven of my native mountains, where I may think and dream in peace, safe from the talons of some old political vulture, safe from the slimy kiss and the keen dagger of ingratitude. He went back to East Tennessee. He then went back to East Tennessee, back to the lecture circuit, and in 1905 founded his Southern periodical, which he humbly titled Bob Taylor's Magazine. Same, <coughs> same year, the senior senator from Tennessee died, and Taylor went after the vacant seat. Once more, the legislature rejected him, but in the next year, he won the first Tennessee Senate primary election. At that point, he merged his magazine with Trotwood's Monthly. Thereafter, Taylor was usually listed with John Trotwood Mo Moore as co-editor. Uh, again, those of you who are into American literature, particularly into Southern literature, and are familiar with the, uh, the, the fugitive movement, uh, Moore's son, Merrill Moore, uh, uh, John Trotwood's Moore's son was Merrill Moore, who was one of the uh, fugitives. Taylor Trotwood magazine was basically edited and published in Nashville, however. Taylor's columns, which were part humor and part serious editorial, frequently promoted the New South Doctrine. 
A lamentable result of modern development and business evolution is its tendency to break up families and homes, Taylor wrote in, April 96, in the April 96 issue of his magazine. The results, however, seemingly beneficial, do not compensate for the destruction of the family altars, the suspension of home influence, and the suffering, severing of state affections. Aside from the wrench to affections, society will surely suffer in the suspension of home training and teaching. Although by endorsing industrialism, Taylor was endorsing a program of change, he was applying it to a conservative cause. The home has been divinely consecrated to the fashion of character, and nowhere else can the twig be properly bent. It needs no demonstration to prove that the life and character of the child suffer permanent injury, and that society is damaged by the infliction of an injurious influence if that child is removed from the secret environments of home before its character is formed and strengthened to withstand the temptations and meet responsibilities. It is one of the most deplorable tendencies of the times, and yet it is receiving scarcely a suggestion that will tend to ameliorate it. But <coughs> the rest of his statement is also revealing, since it defines the nature and rationale of his new New South philosophy. Obviously, he wrote, the most effective means of lessening the distressing tendency will be to bring the opportunities and the inducement to their home. The industrial development that is fast carrying the South to the front, as rich as it seems in promise of material things, will <coughs> seem yet richer in blessings to the people and supplying adequate opportunities to their children. The writer has already suggested the imperative importance of technology schools in the South with unlimited facilities and scope. The thing is now to find one's aptitudes and fit, where, fit them where they belong, he continued, projecting his own pearl need to fly in your own firmament onto society at large. In these days of individual adjustment, if the youth looks about him and fails to find the place that meets his longings and genius, he must of necessity be great. He cannot afford to enter the race handicapped with inadaptability against others who have found their calling. In his book, The New South Creed, <coughs> Paul Gaston has written that by the turn of the century, the heyday of the New South movement was past. He also wrote that education had remained a relatively minor part of the New South Creed. But Taylor was championing both in 1906 and making his contribution to the New South ideology. He was saying that industrial education should be supported to save home and family. His argument grew out of his own obsessive sense of family and place, which in turn grew out of his personal psychological needs and his identification with Landon Carter Haynes. He had synthesized the Haynes themes. If there are, were no other considerations, he wrote, it ought to be sufficient to impel the southern states, every one of them, to hasten to provide the fullest possible opportunities for high technological training, for the influence it will have in keeping our sons at home. Our industries must be conducted by skilled hands, and if we do not impart the skill to our sons, then others must do the work, and ours take subordinate place. I plead for it, however, upon the high ground of home, love, of unbroken family altars, of virtue, affection, and all sacred ties of kinship. Thank you. When Bob and I talked uh, before, just before this session, we were trying to ponder together what connection might exist between his paper and mine, and temporarily we had decided maybe none. As I listened to you, I discovered that there is indeed a very deep connection, and I was pleased um, that I was able to hear your paper instead of our being in two opposite rooms. I think that connection has to do with the basic question, uh, which is the center of my paper, which is, what sense of place can be had by those who leave home? That question has been endemic to conference from the first talk that I heard, the sense of Appalachians who leave home and come back every weekend in their cars and trucks down the highways, those who leave home and somehow feel that they've left something irreparably and that there's a great pain inside. I came to my talk with a sense of that personal odyssey in mind. And, and let me simply say, without trying to draw more connections, that I think your uncle, politician, in some way was trying to resolve that, that central dilemma of in what sense can I be in place when I have this urgent pull to serve the large society, a pull to be a politician, 
to go to Washington, D.C., and at the same time, in some profound way, feel that my sense of place is here in mountains, at home, in a family home that meant everything to me. Um, in preparatory notes, before I, I get into the paper, I'd like to say that, that that question, what sense of place is possible for those of us who walk a path through many places, is the central question for my paper. But there were two other questions. The second one is a simple question. It's how essential is that sense of place? I live in, I live in Southern Maryland. I work in Washington, D.C. And when I talked with colleagues about coming here to the Sense of Place conference, I got a lot of smiles, mostly because people said, what is it, a conference Sense of Place? What do you mean by that? And I found that when I could describe clearly what I meant by it, I touched something in people's hearts. And yet, in a different level, they felt that it was peripheral to real business, so to speak. And so I found myself asking this question, well, how essential is this matter of having a sense of place? And thirdly, I realized both in preparing for this talk and in hearing the talks of the last day that the words sense of place mean many different things and that I should identify that uh, I should identify the fact that as I worked on this presentation and was thinking, there was a primary sense in my mind, that is a sense of place in relationship to land. I think and work a great deal about land issues, water pollution, uh, land degradation, strip mining, all the problems we have with land in this country and somewhat globally. And, and so my work and concern about sense of place had to do with the question, what is our sense of place in relationship to the land? And how essential is that to us? My paper actually has a subtitle, because as I wrote it, I discovered that I had very strong feelings about how essential the sense of place is. And so it's called Rebuilding a Sense of Place, an Ethical Imperative. What images do we hold in our minds for the planetary future? And what role do we have in creating it? That question, seemingly about a matter at the opposite end of the scale from questions about a sense of place here in a town or in Appalachia, is for me inextricably associated with it. The call to this conference named the feeling of homelessness associated with loss of a clear sense of place on the land, suggested that we might consider the sense of home and place had by Appalachians as a kind of balm for healing that loss. It seemed to me, both in coming here in the experience of the last day and in thinking about it, that mindfulness of the lived experience of Appalachia and other places where generations of people have lived out their lives within a specific region is indeed essential to the healing we need in this country. We need to learn with Appalachian poet James Still what it really means to be of these hills, one with the fox, one with the new foal. I sense sometimes, for example, that just as city kids that I talk with don't know where it comes from except from the supermarket, truly that's really true. And that wise, they often don't know where they come from in the sense that Appalachian people do, in the sense of a real connection with the land. If you think a child who grows up in a high-rise apartment building and ask what sense of land is there, it's a real question mark. While that sense, that Appalachian sense of land and the sense of place over long generations is essential to the ha task healing, I'm also convinced that a different, although connected, awareness of what it means to be in place on this planet is in fact coming to be and needs further encouragement and reflection. This new sense of place, I think, involves a difficult balance between commitment to and allowing oneself to be shaped by some defined area of land and people and a deep sense of ourself as citizens of the planet as a whole. It involves a balance between knowing ourself as caregivers and receivers in a particular and dear place and the knowledge that our life path may call us onward to different places. This sense of place that I will address this morning is a place, sense of place possible for those who are pathwalkers as well as dwellers in place. 
a sense for those who have moved from the places in which their roots were formed, perhaps not only once, but many times. Together, I think that these two senses of place are important to consider, not simply for aesthetic or nice or emotional reasons, but because I see them as essential to creating a livable future on this planet. Perhaps because I'm not an historian, my mind is not on the past. My mind is very much on what are we creating for the future. As Kentucky writer, poet, and farmer Wendell Berry put it, the health and even the continuance of our life in America in all regions, I would add on the globe, require that we enact in the most particular term a responsible relationship to the land. And Berry knew very clearly that living out this relationship with land demands having a sense of place. I'd like to speak briefly, because it's important, to the price of losing our sense of place. America is, and perhaps from the time of its summit by Europeans, has been in good part a society of nomads. I think that Appalachians, though stay here in the hills and have stayed here for generations, are sometimes called strange because they haven't been nomadic in the same sense. The society as a whole has been. I come from a nomadic family. Uh, and I was thinking of it, some of my, my family members are now up in Alaska. It's as far as it could get. They were always moving on to the next frontier. And they ended up in the last frontier of this country, Alaska. Unlike hunting and gathering nomads, however, our call to move comes not so much from the pull of weather or harvest or hunting possibilities as from the pull of corporate job opportunities, economic shifts in regional economies, professional advancement, or sometimes for aging people, retirement people, the lure of warmer climates and more hospitable living arrangements. Considering the nature of our professions, our economy and our educational system and our capacity for communications, I think it's unlikely that we will suddenly become a nation of people who largely live out their lives in one place. But the price of our mobility has been high for people and for the land. Artist Alan Gossow, who wrote a book called The Sense of Place, has argued that we are all inevitably a product of our sense of place. And that raises for me the question of in what sense are we also products of our lack of a sense of place our uprootedness and our placelessness. For example, are some of the inner insecurities, the anxieties, and the stresses. We are a high-stress society. And I live in an urban culture where almost everyone I know <laughs> talks about stress. I myself, on occasion, stress reduction workshops. Are some of our stresses caused by our lack of an identity that might more naturally be shaped by a clear sense of place in a particular land and people community. The actual experience of uprooting from a beloved place has a high price, although one that is often ignored by contemporary economics, education, and government policy. We need only consider such obvious situations as a small Kentucky farmer who goes bankrupt in this era of high costs for his farm inputs and low prices for his product and sees no alternate jobs available in the nearby farm communities because of economic depression. We need only consider the family who is displaced when the mineral lights, rights means of land are sold for strip mining, or when jobs are lost in a depressed steel or mining economy. It's not just the ownership of a house. It's not just the things that count on the economic ledger that is lost, but a deep sense of identity in a community, a priceless reality, and yet one that I would argue is apparently counted as worth little or nothing in the economic calculations of our accounting systems. I would like also to say, however, that the price of our mobility has been high for the land. This is a theme that I have found on the whole unaddressed in this conference, um, at least in the talks that I have been in. Wendell Berry speaks of nomadic Americans. This is my favorite quote and someone else's favorite quote earlier this morning. Wendell Berry speaks of nomadic Americans moving about on the face of this continent with the mindless destructiveness that makes Sherman's march to the sea seem like a prank. You have only to think what this country was 200 years ago at the point when the Constitution was formed and most of the West not yet settled. In the early 1980s, the group that I work with held a forum on land ownership, and William Horton of the Appalachian Land Ownership Ta Task Force told us, said very simply, coal companies trade in land and mineral rights to make a lot of money. 
They don't get their rewards on the local level. That's not the arena their minds are in. That just happens to be where they own land. As the report of the Appalachian Regional Commission more recently put it, the wealth derived from Appalachian resources rode out of the area right on the rails with coal cars. It didn't stay here. Would the treatment of, it, of the land and its people be different if the owners, in fact, lived close to their mine sites and didn't envision themselves as able to move at any needed point? Hypothetical question, I don't know, but one of my senses is at least likely. I think that not only corporate leaders or very wealthy businessmen investors are afflicted with the narrowness of vision that comes to disassociation with the land and the complexity of life systems in our contemporary world. If, for example, each of our communities had to store the hazard waste generated by products consumed or manufactured in that region, from nuclear byproducts to petrochemical substances, and we also knew that we and our children would live in that region for generations to come, would we not behave differently toward the generation of toxic substances? The last numbers I heard on the generation of hazardous substances in this country is that this year, despite attempts at federal regulation, they stand at approximately one ton per American per year. And they, they derived as byproducts from the manufacture of all the kinds of things that we're used to consuming in our daily life. Everything that's not natural, that didn't come from the land, that goes through a chemical product, is likely part of that, that hazardous substance byproduct. We're living with that, and we're living with that on the whole because the results of that have been disposed somewhere else out of sight by somebody else, and we're only now beginning to look at the poisoning that has resulted. In considering the state of urban nomadism in America, Wend Berry comments on the idea that there is an optimist, common optimistic assumption that will correct the destructiveness of our present source, of our present course. But I don't believe it, he says. Earlier nomadic civilizations, Barry says, were a response to the climatic or food growing or hunting situations. But in fact, American nomadism has evolved in response to an economy based on deliberate wastefulness. And one of the things we're willing to waste, or have been willing to waste, is the land. In a plenitude of books, Barry articulates an ethic and a way of life based on long-term devotion to a particular place and to the land, one which he now pursues on his small Kentucky farm, because, as he says, he believes this holds the only possibility, not simply for a decent life, but for the survival of our civilization. <coughs> These are strong words. I think that Barry is absolutely right about the importance of a sense of place and about the relationship to a, of a sense of place to protection of the land. Mm -hmm. But I hope that he is wrong in his prediction that it is impossible for urban, professional, and mobile Americans to build any sense of place. Indeed, I think it is essential that we begin to articulate some way of being in place on land that is possible within this civilization as we know it and as we are living in it. Becoming mountaineers or small farmers or country store owners is not a possibility for most of us anymore. Living in one place for generations is not happening. And I think we need some positive sense, perhaps at least for a transitional time, maybe we will move on to that again in the future, positive sense of a different way to be on the land. For me, the sense that I have flows from considering two factors in connection with the values of commitment to a particular place. One of those is what I call, think today, is a healthy pull towards thinking of ourselves as global citizens. And the other pull toward a new sense of place is based on the possibility of learning essential matters about a sense of place precisely in the course of being on a path and living in different places. I'd like first to address the global citizenship matter. To me, the idea of being a global citizen allows us to see the importance of moving toward a new sense of place, not simply to replace our homelessness or get something that's second best. You know, if we can't have what we really want, which is to be in place, well, then let's have this other thing. Something about thinking about myself on the planetary globe that meets a new rationale for developing a sense of place, and that is to meet a new and pressing need, which is caring for that planetary whole. 
In reflecting on images of the planet Earth as seen from space, the bright blue marble image that many of you have seen on postcards or in textbooks, scientist and philosopher René Dubois and historian Barbara Ward wrote in their book, Only One Earth, that each of us now has two countries, our own country and the planet Earth. And historian Donald Webster more recently has commented that that revelation of where we live means not just absorbing one more fact, but in fact a revolution in our way of being. It's my thesis that accomplishing this revolution is not a luxury, it's a basic need. The whole documented in the ozone layer cannot be fixed by any one region or any one town or any one small group of people. It demands common action on a global level. Um, those of you who, who read about ecology these days know that we are looking at the fact that the ozone layer over Antarctica has a hole in it which appears to be growing bigger each year. And as my sense of ethics looks at that, I, I'm very aware that from the scientific data, it appears that the people in Argentina, particularly in Argentina, may be the first to experience the high cancer, higher cancer rates that flow from that exposure, when in fact the causes may be in our northern hemisphere industrial nations. And we have the responsibility for that, I think. Not only the ozone layer, but solving the problem of acid position, the protection of biological pathways for migratory creatures, you know, the birds, the fowl, the everything else that doesn't stay in one place, but that migrate over huge continents, incredible distances, the monarch butterfly goes, incredible distances those geese go every year. And we look at them as they went their way over our place, but they depend upon a planetary hull. Economics as well, and all the consequent impacts on our jobs and lives are increasingly international matters. Drought, good crops in the farming areas of the Soviet Union, Australia, or Argentina, in fact impact on the market and livelihood of farmers in Ohio, Nebraska, and Kentucky. As nations and as individuals, we are less and less islands apart. And in this context, it is helpful to recall that having a sense of place can be taken to mean knowing one's location in the whole. It interests me, moreover, that it is primarily urban professionals, environmental organizations, at such groups as, and such groups as the United Nations and other global concern groups, who we might ordinarily decry as lacking the kind of sense of place that we have celebrated here, who are in fact acting on matters of global environmental concern. This to me is a positive fact because it says that for these people there is some new sense of place that they take responsibility for um, that, that leads on to a, a, a possibly new sense of place as a whole. Um, this positive fact joined with the deep feeling that it is either unwise or perhaps impossible to attempt to reform an earlier localized consciousness which lacks informed knowledge of the global whole is what leads me to focus on ways to rebuild a sense of place by linking essential elements of the old with new perceptions still evolving. And so I'd like to turn here to what I, I think may be our new elements of a, a possible sense of place for what I call pathwalkers. Any new awareness of place will, I'm convinced, be rooted in deep experience and commitment to some particular places. I am deeply suspicious of building a global sense of place on the planet without its being rooted in the experience of particular places, as I am of the old religious concern about people who love humankind without that love being at all illumined by love of particular people, very real, imperfect, particular persons. I think it's possible to gather, for urban professionals, to gather some knowledge about the importance of this sense place by reading particular books or by visiting places. For example, I could say that it's in Washington, D.C. I took a look at a small book that I haven't seen out here, a book by Jesuit Father Al Frisch and Berea, Kentucky photographer Warren Brunner, which was called Appalachia, a Meditation. And I, I kept sensing it. It was a book of short reflections and photography of Appalachia, something that was important to me. I, I opened it up and have turned its pages over numerous times in the last six months, looking at the snow-covered hollers and the, the wood-beam houses and the slashed hillsides of strip-mined land and trying to, to, to figure out what's important to me about this. Why am I drawn to this? It seemed to me that the people here were more in touch with basic human processes than concerned about the artificial needs to keep their clothes in style 
or have their front yards mowed, which occupies city people a lot. Few of us, in fact, from a city environment, would choose the poverty that seemed to exist in the photograph. The picture called quickly to my mind the statistic that in central Appalachia, the poverty rate still stands at twice the national average. But many of us yearn for such seeming, some such seeming simplicity of life, getting down to essentials. Here at least, the photographs say, place is more important than the ever-whirling stream of progress, new consumer goods, and new media events. But I do not think that urban people can understand the values of such a sense of place as an outsider. I think we must, in some way, give ourselves over to a particular place. And I know that my own concerns about this stem from what I count as a lucky experience of having 18 years of growing up in such a place. I grew up in a small fishing village in the northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan, a place that's so rooted, I think, in my consciousness and my sense of perceiving the world that I have sometimes teased that I'm still more Sarah of Leland, Michigan, than I am anything else. I can recall without effort, as your Appalachians recall their misty hills, the scent of early June wild roses that grew on the sandbanks along the lake, the touch and the smell of the wet moss in the woods when I walked them after school at night, the exact curve and bumps of the minister's yard on which we went sledding in the winter, the curve just like that, <laughs> I can still feel it in my stomach, and the feeling of the fishing boat roof beneath my feet just before I jumped off into the fish creek to swim. From this experience, I know in my hands, in my heart, in my bones, not just my head, the truth of the first effect of having a sense of place, that I and place are in some way one. For all my life, that Michigan place has been a criteria of every other lake shore, woods, and sledding hill I have been on. And the independent and proud spirit of the people is in me as well. It's not by accident, I realize, that my husband and I live where we can grow a lot of our food in a house which we have worked on with our own hands instead of hiring carpenters and interior decorators, and by a woods out of which we gather at least some of our winter's heat, not the whole, but some. That unravaged land of my childhood, because I grew up in, in what these days is called one of the outstanding landscapes of the country, a beautiful lakeshore spot, didn't seem in those years to call for more than appreciation from me, but I think that simple response had in it the nucleus of another more important fruit of having a sense of place, which is the realization that the earth is a gift giver and it is a sacred source. I say that slowly because that's an important concept. The realization that it's not just there and it didn't just happen, that the earth is a gift giver, that I was given an enormous treasure in that experience and that it is somehow a sacred experience. Alfrich puts it this way in his Appalachian Meditations. He says, the earth is our teacher about wholeness, which is to say about holiness. I'm going to need to skip a little bit because of time here, I think. Only later in life, coming to live on the patch of southern Maryland farmland that had been logged with the creek silted in and the hillsides bare of any topsoil at all, and nothing obviously beautiful in sight, a piece of land that one might call a sick piece of land, did I come face to face with another basic need learned by commitment to a place, which is the need to give back in return to what is given to us by the earth, and the slow process of learning how to heal the land in ways that are suited to its nature. I think had I stayed on in Michigan, I would have learned that well there. My point here is that such lessons, that sense of I am one with the land, that sense of it is given something to me and it is given that it is sacred, and the sense of I must, I am called to give something back, are not simply learned by intellectual things. They, are, they, they come to you out of living that. I would like to turn briefly to the, the personal experience of growth, however, in the sense of walking a path through many different places. Things that I learned in New York City, seeing the towering Douglas firs outside of Portland, Oregon, sensing the sense of the desert in Arizona. These are images that also come back into my mind, and I feel that from them I have learned a fourth important thing about the sense of place, which is the importance of experiencing different places differently. 
I say that uh, it appears to be almost a simple thing, and yet I think in this country that simple thing has been overlooked. We have only to what we typically do in our management of places. Consider a holiday inn, which looks much the same here in um, this village as it does outside of Maryland, as it does in Kentucky, Michigan, Wisconsin, almost any place else except maybe the extreme west. And ask yourself, what would happen if they tried to think of that Holiday Inn as an inn in this place, the vegetation that is native to this place, that speaks of this place, so that someone who came to this Holiday Inn would know that they were here in this specific town with this sense of place, and realize that, um, that we don't really understand that we need to experience different things differently. Um, uh, there, there are many examples of that, but, but let me go on. From these considerations also comes another element that I think is learned by consideration of different places, and that is that action on the land, whether for beauty or for profit, ought to consider the specific nature of the place and ought to be managed at least in contact with those who really understand for and care for that place. And I think that idea alone could revolutionize land management here and across the nation. And finally, a fifth point that, that I'd like to make that I have learned in the sense of, of my path walking is a sensitivity to the fact that things don't need to be the way they are if the way they are is sick. One result of cultural attitudes that have placed profit before place and beauty and people, in which think of animals, plants, and minerals as lesser beings than humans, becomes apparent when one travels or lives in many different places. For example, Aldo Leopold, who's the father of what's called the land ethic in America, wrote that after years and years and years of working on desert and forested and lands in the southwest, only after he traveled to a wilderness area in northern New Mexico did he realize that the lands he'd been working with for years were sick, that something was out of balance in them. He could only see that by seeing the difference. And from understanding that difference came his own commitment to healing the land, a work which became a life work for him. Uh, I speak a little bit in the middle part of my paper about the paradoxical resolution that I think is needed between that deep experience of dwelling in place, which I think is central to having a sense of place at all, and the experience of being on a path towards understanding the whole, which many of us are journeying in in our professional, our intellectual, or our spiritual journey. And I say very briefly that, um, that, that we must, if we have not before, if we have not had the luck to grow up with it, we must, I think, to know about sense of place at some point, put our feet down and grow roots and, and do that on a particular piece of land. We must at all costs learn what the Zen, think, Zen thinkers call mindfulness because it's possible to be in places and travel through their mind and not really see what's there in a depth at all. Um, what I would like to do with the remaining minutes that I have is a few questions, because I think that the remarks which I have made here about the fact that there is indeed a need to rebuild a sense of place, and that, that we're looking at a question of building a sense of place, many of us, that for which we can get some guidance from the past, but on which we're walking on kind of an odd trod path, is that, that, that it raises basic questions about educational, our political, and, and, our, and our lived um, lives. The first question that I'd like to point to is that we need to ask how is respect and nurturing for this sense of place on the land built in our educational system? For example, can elementary and high school students learn what is wonderful and mysterious about the place where they live while still living there in that place? Its history, its geology, its basic life systems, its unique spots, its wildlife, and the pressures on its systems and on the lives of its people. Couldn't they learn, for example, what was once there on the spot before their school building was there, and what might happen when it crumbled down, and what would replace it? This might give them a sense of the, the lived history of this place. The trouble, of course, is that these sorts of things are not in textbooks that are mass-produced and from which teachers of necessity teach. And it takes a good deal of energy, time, and personal commitment on the part of teachers who do try to do this to raise such topics to pursue them, and often a heavy uphill battle against built-in obstacles. My son is in a school which has allowed one field trip per class per year. This doesn't allow much time for getting out and getting acquainted with the land. But I think as educators and as future teachers, some of you at least will be, the question is how can we change this if we really value a sense of place? 
My question is only deep when we consider college and university curriculums. My PhD in philosophy was gained in the mid-1970s without being touched by any hint of interest in the places where I had lived. The philosophies of its peoples were the questions of the sort we raised here today. I have taught philosophy, in fact, I must admit, without teaching about the sense of place or paying any particular attention to the place in which I taught. But surely there's some wrong with this. And so my question is, how can our colleges and universities help faculty and students appreciate both our dwelling places on these campuses and the relationship of this place to the places from which our students have come? In our task of leading students to understanding, we must not address these matters. Wendell Berry speaks of the knowledge of place as local life aware of itself, a wonderful phrase, and it draws many ideas to mind, oral histories that students could do, ecological studies that students could do, the work of the Foxfire series, which are down in your bookstore, the work of a very dedicated teacher who with his students explored the life of a region and published it, and led them into an exciting learning venture. I think there are models for this, but I think our educational system still much too much ignores the sense of place. Secondly, education reflects society as a whole. And my second question, and indeed the tougher ones, have to do with how in any way at all an economic, professional, and corporate culture can be led to respect and foster the value of places and the building of the sense of place. Um, bottom line figures on business ledgers don't contain lines for ecological damage the damage to the land or the upping of people resulting from actions taken by profit for profit. So the question is, how can we build an economic system that shows some respect for place and the sense of place? And I argue here briefly in the paper um, that um, our, our attitude towards private property has much to do with this and has to do uh, with the live out this sense. I quote, for example, the recent statement of the Catholic bishops on the economy, which says, that the goods of this earth are common property and that men and women are summoned to faithful stewardship rather than to simple appropriation or exploitation of what was just at all. How would it affect our sense of private property ownership, whether you're a mine owner, whether you're only an owner of a tiny chunk of land, to have a sense that that land was destined for the good of the community? And what do we need to do? I think my, my personal sense is that if we could incorporate that sense, that it would build our sense of place. Uh, but I think we have a long way to go to, to get to that sense. I think we need to ask basic questions about our, our notion of private property rights and responsibilities. Third, I think we need to ask questions about all members of a place and whether or not a place, a sense of place, is a good sense of place for all of the people and creatures who are living in it. We have in this nation a democracy, but I think we have failed often, and earlier in this conference on racism and class elitism, really raised questions about whether the places, and indeed the traditional places and the traditional sense of place, opened up positive experiences of a sense of place to all its inhabitants. And I would like to include the non-human inhabitants, the vanishing species know, among those. Fourth, I think we need to ask the question about how we can build in our society a recognition of the fact that we really do have different senses of places and how we encourage interaction between them. John Opie, on the first, in his first morning talk, addressed the difficulty of a New York journalist who came to a dirt poor Alabama farm and tried to understand what was, what was there. And the, the, the difference between those two worlds was so great it was, was difficult to communicate between them. I think we need to learn ways to communicate between them. We need, for example, as teachers to ask, you know, are we in fact talking to the people of this place on this land where we teach? And what can we learn from them? How do we set up these mutual connections? In the context of the questions I have suggested here, a conference such as this one is not a culmination, but a beginning. I think it is good to appreciate the values of an Appalachian sense of place, but it is not enough to do so without commitment to further action, because to consider these things is to raise basic questions about our culture in its direction, questions whose root, I think, is an ethical imperative which challenges us to vision a different future. I am an idealist, and the future that I image is one in which people, all our people, 
could indeed treasure their places, a future in which we could appreciate and heal and grow in relation to places, and one in which the places themselves are better off for our being there as they are in our relation, for our relation to them. In this future, thinking about the land, the question, what can I give back to the land, would be a steadier refrain as the question, what is the land giving to me? I admit this is an ideal, uh, but it's ideals, I think, that drive us in our life. And I think that we can begin step by step the transformations that are needed to reawaken and nourish that sense of place that we have almost inadvertently destroyed. Robert Frost, the poet, wrote, the land was ours before we were the lands. We have, in fact, in this country, in 200 years, claimed it, its fruits from coast to coast of our property, our mines, our farms and ranches, our home sites and parks. But no successful claiming that marriage is a one-way relationship. We must, in turn, somehow allow ourselves to be claimed by the land. Here in Appalachia and in a million of other places, we hold the future of the planet in those choices. And I think that those choices depend to a large extent upon the depth, the real depth and reality of the questions that we're prepared to ask each of us. What is my sense of place here and on the planet? How am I committed to it? What am I in my life doing for it? Thank you.